So here we're looking at the toasted cars. Patrick Connolly was right around the corner there when one of the towers was turning to dust. He had to head for cover and he managed to get inside that door. This is building seven. He went in there and started to go down to the bomb shelter in the basement and said something's not right here. The bomb shelter was destroyed down in the basement. So he came out, <clears throat> couldn't really see where he was going, and starts heading up the road. And as he was heading up the road, making his way, thank goodness those cars went into spontaneous combustion, because then he had light and could see where he was going. It was total blackout. Notice the unburned paper all over the place. Here's where the towers were, FDR Drive. That's West Broadway. I sometimes refer to it as the swamp because it kind of looked like a swamp. With all the wet paper, you know, fire hoses on the paper and dust and junk, only the cars there were toasted. That's the toasted car park, FDR Drive. Now some folks believe that the cars were towed there. Well, not all of them were towed there. I don't know if any were, but I know some were not. There is a first responder down here who witnessed the spontaneous combustion of these cars. And like George Stephanopoulos' friend, was trying to explain it away and thought maybe a fireball got loose from one of the towers and rolled down the street and caught the cars on fire. That was the best he could come up with. Also what was interesting is over here on the Manhattan Bridge, there were some first responders, some EMTs driving towards the World Trade Center. They said you could feel the heat from the bridge. It was so hot from the towers. But paper over here was not burned. How could you feel heat from there? I'll bet she felt something and interpreted as heat. Some kind of energy field. Because that's quite a distance away. <clears throat> so now we're going to look at where Patrick Connolly walked up West Street, at uh, West Broadway. Again, there's the car park and there's West Broadway. It goes right past Building 7. So he came out of that door from Building 7 and started walking up. And this distance all the way up here, just, you know, end to end toasted cars. Here's Building 7. He came up to intersection C, turned left at that point. You can see from above toasted cars all the way up to here in a wet street with, you know, the mushy uh, wet paper and debris and so forth. Now, what caught the, all those cars on fire, if, they were, if you believe they're caught on fire? Falling debris from the towers? Well, why didn't it fall on these buildings? Only well, dust fell on those buildings. So how did the burning debris get down in the canyons? Yeah, that's a pretty deep canyon. Here's Building 7. It was early enough in the day that you don't see any fire yet coming out of uh, Building 7 or any... It doesn't look like it's in distress. This bus, uh, to me, it doesn't look like it burned up. Burnt things usually look black. And then soot. I don't see any flame marks. This car here looks rusted. That's pretty fast for steel to rust. This is West Broadway. Notice the missing door handle. Missing engine. Go, let's go. Go. Wow. Three, two. Oh, man. One. More debris falling from a nearby building, the World Trade Center. We're at West Broadway in Barclay. Very difficult to breathe here, but look around. This must have been ground zero where this thing blew up. Car after car after car, buses, completely obliterated and burned straight down to the steel. Behind me. That engine block? Wait, what, why would it be gone? 
that hood. Oops, I didn't need to go. There we go. So this is more of that same street. Missing door handles. Another one looks like the engine, something happened to it. Engine compartment. Rusty car. This is still early in the day. Building 7 is still in good shape. I don't know what that is. It kind of looks like a leg of a pavement there. But some strange things. Notice the, the trunk lids popped open. Uh, doors open like the latches disintegrate quickly. This police car is interesting. Right at the, where the door seam is, it's toasted back there, but not up in the front. As though the rubber gasket seals it, like, you know, electricity. Don't know. Nice tire. But uh, strange uh, disintegration or toasting. Now, folks say, well, yeah, car fires are like that. I can tell you the difference between these cars and a regular car fire. Look at this windshield, or lack of. It looks like it was wire brushed almost, ready for another paint job. Cars that have been burnt from a car fire, you'd find scraps of glass left in, in the corner somewhere. This is like everything gone. <clears throat> Here's the corner where Patrick Connolly turned. It was pitch black. You couldn't have seen your hand in front of your face if it weren't for whatever this was. It looks like fire. Now, it's things I call Cheetos. It looks like little Cheetos on the ground. I, I brought along from the United States example of Cheetos. <laughs> they look just like that. There's little orange things. Ah, now you know. What, what you call it, what's it here? <laughs> See how this looks like it's little orange glowing things. Now, you're not going to confuse that with snack food, but I'm pointing out that there's something weird about it, this orange thing. It doesn't really act like hot things would. And so I sometimes refer to this as a Cheeto fire. I don't want to make it assume that it's a regular fire. It may be, but maybe it isn't. This sure isn't regular. This is a, a contrast, high contrast version of this. Look at this fire, on the, what appears to be fire, on the side of the van. What's burning? Just the side panel of the van has flames coming out of it. And I didn't see one bit of evidence showing a gas tank or a petrol tank exploded. They didn't seem to explode. It was something else going on. Paper, not burn. <laughs> Do you think they're used to seeing that? There's uh, some of the, in some of the transcripts, they, they say, well, you know, we're waiting for so-and-so, so we just start putting out car fires. You know, what else is there to do? But it was also interesting, some of them said initially the water had no effect on these fires. Hot things glow, but not everything that glows is hot. Yes, hot things do glow, but just because it's glowing doesn't mean it's hot. I don't know if you have fireflies here. <laughs> they glow. They glow probably from a chemical type thing. Also, there's, these are, I guess, incandescent bulbs, but there's also fluorescent bulbs. They produce heat from different mechanisms. Fluorescent bulb, you wouldn't want to unscrew it while it's hot. Fluorescent bulb, no problem. So there's a different mechanism. Thinking about that, uh, you have what appears to be unburned paper, something glowing. And someone in the, uh, the truther movement would often say, see, molten metal. Wait a minute, molten metal from heat? Oh, why isn't the paper burning? You get some of these orange Cheetos over here. And so as you have Cheetos sitting on paper, paper's not burning. That doesn't make sense. Another big thing with this is that this is aluminum cladding from the buildings. Pure aluminum melts at about 660 Fahrenheit, I mean centigrade. It's lower, slightly lower if it's um, an alloy. 
So no more than 660 centigrade, probably 600 centigrade, is the melting temperature of the aluminum cladding, somewhere in the low 600s. Um, to get this much, you know, white hot, yellow hot, it's got to be like 1100 centigrade. Houston, we have a problem. Why isn't this drooped over? Aluminum glows, but when it's a puddle. Here's a close-up view of this corner. It kind of looks like the aluminum is even glowing. But if this is white hot fire down here, that aluminum would be melted. So it appears that it's glowing for a reason other than heat. <coughs> now fluorescent bulbs uh, kind of a use of, of um, plasma instead of resistance heating uh, for the incandescent bulb. If this uh, debris field were hot, would you put an oxygen hose over it? And would you be standing at the other end with a cutting torch? That, that's you know, suicide, kaboom, but nobody blew up. So this is not from heat. What is this? And these guys, if this was, was hot, it would be like standing on your, your backyard grill. And they'd be like, uh, you know, grilled cheese sandwich. <laughs> but they look like they're alive and well. So I wouldn't say that's hot. A lot of people have seen this uh, image saying, ah, that's proof of heat. Because somebody has this picture and labeled these points. On this picture that was partly a combination between NASA, USGS, and Jet Propulsion Lab, uh, one took a picture, one added something else, and so maybe something got lost along the way, or maybe it's correct data but misinterpreted as thermal heat. This might be something else, some other interesting energy signal. So this point E, they say it's 819 Fahrenheit. There's 819 Fahrenheit. See, the little lump there is building three, or the remains of it. Here's building three. There's a lake there. A water main broke, filled the street with water. And this guy is even walking around in knee-deep water. He doesn't look like a boiled chicken. Water boils at 212 Fahrenheit. So uh, that's not hot. Or it's not water. Again, this is the, the swamp, West Broadway. Lots of unburned paper. Bushy trees, full foliage, not burned. The buildings are not burned. Traffic lights, potted in the ground, are not burned or melted. Uh, this guy's engine had better days. Rear end here is kind of on the ground. So for several blocks, all the cars were toasted. No trees toasted, no buildings toasted, no signposts toasted. Do you see a pattern? Cars are up on rubber tires. They're insulated from the ground. Things that go into the ground are grounded. Maybe that has something to do with it. This is during the cleanup. You'll see spontaneous combustion over there. There's a closer up image, but here you have hydraulic equipment that isn't damaged. It's operational. Stuff would just light up. People would say this is fire burning for 99 days. Well, it's not hot fire. You know, that, that equipment, again, hydraulics are permanently damaged if operated over uh, 82 degrees centigrade, about 180 Fahrenheit. This one is The women go in and out of ground zero up to 10 times a night, often until two in the morning, delivering whatever it is rescue workers need to do their jobs, like the ones working in the hot spots. Steel-toed boots is one of the biggest things. Steel-toed um, boots? Steel-toed boots. Out still on the rubble, it's still, uh, I believe, 1,100 degrees. The guy's boots. 
just melt within a few hours, um, and they're burning their feet. The guy's boots melt in a few hours. <laughs> we have no reports of burned feet. Yet, this statement was repeated over and over again. I don't blame these gals at all. They're trying to explain something. Boots are apparently disintegrating. And they need to be replaced for some reason. But if it was 1100 degrees and these guys are walking around in boots that are melting, we should at least have a, a few reports of burned feet. As I like to say, my, if my steel oven is melting, the turkey inside is more than well done. <laughs> Yet this was repeated, kind of like the uh, buildings evaporated line. People don't realize that they are, hear something and they repeat it over and over again. We all do it to some extent, but it's hard to not do it. We, we're, we operate like a herd, and we like to go with the herd. Rudy Giuliani also had made an interesting statement. There were fires of 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit below the ground. I could be standing here, and you could be standing there, and I could be describing to you, Governor, the, the, the site, and then a fire would break out in between us. And uh, it was just by luck or the design of God that we weren't killed. 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. They're standing on a grill, and they're not cooked hotter than a grill. But there's something that reminded them of fire, and that was the best they could explain it, probably. So let's see, that's that one. Um, another phenomenon I talk about is rolled up carpets. Looks like that. You know, carpets come rolled up, but uh, how does that apply to the building? Well, looking at how the tower is constructed, it has these prefab units of three columns wide by three stories tall, and they're loaded axially. So if you overload them, whether the building is, uh, you know, steel gets too hot, so it can't hold the weight, or you co-op something down on it, it's going to buckle. Whether it buckles in or out, it'll buckle. So it'll curve around the horizontal axis, like this. It'll bend around the, it'll like bend over around the horizontal axis. Um, so why are these columns straight? A nice hole in the ground there, it's empty. Not much else around, but straight. They weren't bent over. There were some columns that were bent, but when things, you know, you've probably squashed aluminum cans, you have a very sharp corner on them. Not smooth like that, and these are not even cracked. I don't know how you could bend that, even if you heated it. A smooth bend like that without cracking it. More than 180 degrees. Those vertical columns were found bent around the vertical axis, not bent over around the horizontal axis. They were curved around the vertical axis. That makes sense. They kind of look like a rolled up carpet. Straight columns, but they're, they're curled around the vertical axis. And uh, that sure doesn't look like a buckled column. It looks more like a piece of lasagna noodle. Some I-beams also curled around the vertical axis. Instead of, if you overloaded something, it would sag like that. So how, what explains this? And a smooth curvature. Mm -hmm. Here's some columns of wheat checks falling down, a section of them. This is down where building six is, uh, three is. This is tower two coming apart. This is higher up because you don't see building three yet. So this chunk here, as it falls, notice this zone here. You see the material is missing. So this thing came apart between these two images on its way down. Why? It wasn't overloaded. Then in Banker's Trust, there's this 
beam or column. I don't think there's any way you can mechanically load this beam to get what we saw. Loading it, however, does not do that. That looks like a rubber band that was snapped or something that was uh, melted or coiled up and whatever. There's no fire in this building and steel doesn't melt like that. It's got some holes there, but this wrinkling here, that cannot be explained by any mechanical loading. Proof of concept. Something caused this. I can't tell you what caused this because I'm not the one who ran the equipment. But I can show you some, uh, something that can replicate all of the effects we've seen. Here's these columns we saw at the World Trade Center. This is what someone has done in their lab. This metal is not uh, kinked not buckled, smooth curvature. This is solid copper, about two and a half inches in diameter. And this is solid molybdenum. Here's that uh, lasagna noodle. Now we have uh, WFC1. What's interesting, again, no pock marks in the surface from being like um, a machine gun. The windows are busted and the marble facade, 100% of the marble facade is missing, kind of like uh, porcelain toilets. And we have this parking problem in front. This car is toasted, but this one uh, has the tires that go in the wrong direction. It's upside down. Doesn't look too toasted. The inner pane is still intact, but the outer pane is broken. Rocks don't do that. So we have evidence of levitation and toasting, or toasting or levitation. Here's evidence of more evidence of le levitation. Street, and I picked up the camera just out of habit. And something in the back of my mind said, run, run, run. And never in 20 years of shooting in New York have I run from an assignment. But something in the back of my head just said, run. And as I hit the corner of Liberty Street, um, it was almost being picked up by a tornado. Almost being picked it's up like by a wave. It was like being picked up with a black cloud. With that black cloud had substance. Mm. It was like night, but it had, yeah. had a solid feel to it. It was like gravel, hot gravel, mm. and just picked me up and tossed me about a block. I just, at one second I was running and the next second I was airborne. And I, I, I lost my glasses, I lost my cell phone, I lost my pager, but managed to hold on to both cameras. Mm. But it threw you for a block? I was back down at Ground Zero last week and walked the area where I have a pretty good recollection of where I was and where I wound up. And it was it was just under it was just under a city block. It was this blast of warm air. It wasn't hot. It was warm, and it picked me up and threw me up against the wall of the building. That was you were picked up off the ground. Physically picked up off the ground. I remember an explosion. At that point, I got knocked out. I don't remember anything. Then I got up, and I looked out the window because the windows exploded, and the street below caved in. There was an EMT who was 
carried down some stairs. She didn't know how she got down there, so the uh, best explanation she'd come up with is that she died, and God picked her up and carried her. She floated down the stairs. Also, those uh, first responders who were in the bottom stairwell of uh, stairwell B of Tower 1, while the tower was coming apart, they talked about having been floated up and down the stairs. They thought maybe they were being tossed, but they were going from the third floor to the fourth floor to the third floor. Here's what somebody reproduced in their lab. It's a toy boat here. They have water flying upward. Now, folks often say this, this guy is a hoax. He films everything upside down in a box. How do you do that with water? Can you hold the water to, the, to a box with a magnet? This water is wafting upward. That's just a taste. We'll come back to that. Let's look at the weather that day. <clears throat> it's a high pressure system moving eastward that they showed on the Fox News. They also showed on CBS, weather over Manhattan as nice as can be. Kind of interesting. Then we have Geraldo Rivera a year ago. He knows about all the hurricanes. For the past 40 years, he's celebrating of, of doing the news. They're reminiscing all the various hurricanes along the way. And this was just a year ago he, he said this. Morning. You know, people ask me why I have been so attracted over the years to hurricane coverage, but it, it, there's risk involved. There is, uh, you know, the peril of not knowing what's going to happen, mm -hmm. that adventure, and it's pitting yourself against the, an enemy. It's like war, only no one is shooting at you specifically. Uh, yeah, that's what the allure, but there is an area storm that I am not, that I, the juices don't flow, and you yeah. look and check it out. Look at that. And Remember that? When that? Oh. I watched that, oh, boy, live. Yeah, that live too. <laughs> and maybe a store on YouTube. <laughs> But, uh, you know, uh, you got to get up okay? close and personal. And Which, the, this is Hurricane Ike, I think. This, uh, that was recent. That was, uh, wasn't this uh, Rita? You would know. You know what I think it was, Rita? Is it? Rita in Galveston, Texas. Yeah, yeah. Galveston. Oh, no, no, and, uh, uh, you know, obviously Katrina before that changed so many of our histories. It was so, so traumatic. You know, and it's well, one funny thing I think of. I think of if only a hurricane had come on 9-11. Remember, they didn't knew mm -hmm. how, they didn't know how to use instruments. The mm -hmm. terrorists they they took off in Boston, right. and they literally, after they took over the aircraft, they steered by line of sight, and it was that crystal clear yeah. September day. Sure was. Yeah. And if it were only uh, one of these weather days, history would have been rewritten. And I think about that a lot now, and especially this time of year. So, are you still the peak of hurricanes? Is. Yeah, you're celebrating 40 years. 40, 40 years. years. Imagine that. Didn't 40 that? years. Every yeah. yeah. hurricane that he misses. He missed that one. This was on 9-11. There's the hurricane he wished for. There's New York, right off the end of Long Island, Cape Cod, it was actually raining that day. There was an airline attendant who flew out of Boston that morning. He didn't know there was a hurricane until he saw it on my website. He said that before they take off, they have kind of a powwow with the, the the crew, the pilot, the flight attendants, and so forth, about anything, any anomaly they need to deal with. No mention of a hurricane. Pretty interesting. That hurricane was the longest lived hurricane of the season, the first major hurricane of the season. Started out the end of August. Came up this way, and the four days leading up to 9 11, it went in a straight line to New York City. 8 o'clock in the morning, pulls up, like pulled up to a chalk line, stopped, and turned around that afternoon and started heading out of town. While it was the closest point, it was the largest, kind of unpacked, like a figure skater kind of stops, and then got smaller again and headed out of town. Kind of weird that we didn't hear about it. What do hurricanes do, after all? Well, here's a storm front. Here's the ground. You have a, like a static field between the two. Ahead of a, 
a hurricane or a weather system. You know, people often say they can feel the weather coming, they can feel the weather changing, because they feel that different energy system. And you often get dry thunder ahead of a weather system. It's sort of like uh, arcing between two points. You know, when you drag your feet along, coming up to, you know, across the carpet and come up to a door handle and reach out, you get a spark, it arcs across. It's kind of like that. Guess what? On 9-11, the three major airports surrounding Manhattan reported thunder. In uh, JFK Airport, LaGuardia Airport, and Newark Airports. So we know that hurricane was close enough to cause a static field around it. Here's what was shown on the four, these four networks. About 10 minutes to 15 minutes before the North Tower got its hole, before the first event of the day. So there's no reason to not have business as usual. I drew in these red arrows pointing out the lightning all around the perimeter of the country. Because there's this high pressure system, and all around the edge of that, you had an electrical storm going on. But here's what should have been shown. And a, weather, uh, a weatherman that I know, Scott Stevens, said, like, how much, how much effort does it take to put an icon on the map? Here. This is the approximate size of the hurricane and the location at that moment in full view, is right against the coast. Let's look at the Earth's magnetic field. Oops. Several days before 9-11, it was kind of uneventful. Now, this was recorded in Alaska, ground-based magnetometers at six different locations. I also looked at satellite magnetometers. That was uneventful until about a day later until the day after 9-11, so it, there was no um, uh, space storms, you know, the sun had, didn't have any coronal mass ejections or anything like that in this time period. These vertical lines are when each of the major events happened on 9-11. <clears throat> WTC-1 first gets its hole, and then WTC-2 gets its hole. WTC-2 goes poof, 1 goes poof, and building 7 goes poof. But the key thing here is, approaching this, notice about 20 minutes before the North Tower gets its hole, the magnetic field starts to shift downward. As soon as it gets its hole, it starts back upward. And as soon as the second tower gets its hole, it goes horizontally again. But it starts going downhill, really goes downhill after Tower 2 goes away, and then when Tower 1 goes poof, it really drops off its haywire all afternoon until Building 7 goes poof. Just coincidence, right? Then it's sort of back to normal almost. Now, what was going on all during this time? All of that, uh, the fumes and stuff were pouring out of Building 7. Like all of the mass was pouring out of Building 7, it was dustifying. So here's the magnetometer readings. Here is the weather reported at JFK Airport. Notice the humidity goes down in a linear pattern. This is the pressure, air pressure at JFK Airport. Notice it was going up because we had the high pressure system moving in. At the same time, the hurricane was moving in from the other direction. And guess when they met? 10 a.m. on the morning of 9-11. We have two counter-rotating systems. Um, hurricanes move one direction. High pressure systems in the northern hemisphere move the opposite direction. They sometimes call them anti-cyclones. So the hurricane's a cyclone and the um, high pressure system's an anti-cyclone. So two counter-rotating systems right over each other. Let's get back to more proof of concept. The Hutchison effect. John Hutchison's work reproduces all of these same effects, all of them, more than the ones that I've even shown you. A summary of the type of uh, effect, jellification, things turn into jelly. And then when the 
when you turn the gizmo off, they resolidify if they haven't separated completely. And recall the curved beams and columns that weren't kinked or buckled or crackled. Bent beams, slow bending of metals, shredded metal structures, fractured metal structures, peeling appearance, like the metal's just peeled open, even though it's a, an extruded metal. Fusion of dissimilar materials, like um, paper, melt, looks like it's melted inside of steel. That's pretty weird. Fitting and rapid aging, lift or disruption, toasted looking metal, circular holes in material, like buildings. Reduced mass of materials, rounded holes in glass, lather, there's a tremendous amount of, you know, weird fires. And then we have this fellow, George Piggott. He actually came up with this earlier. Do you realize 100 years today, his patent was granted on this technology? Today, 100 years. Here he is with his little bow tie on, observing his experiment. I think that's a, a, a kind of an interesting picture. He's got a static field generated. There's a Leyden jar somewhere. And he's got these balls suspended in that field. Levitation. Interesting, a static field. He applied for the patent in 1903. That was a long time ago. Thomas Townsend Brown did a lot of work on anti-gravity. Ed Leedskallen built Coral Castle in Florida. He's said to be, have been about 100 pounds, but he'd lift 15 ton stones, somehow. Here's part of Coral Castle. Here's the Great Pyramid, John Hutchison. Now, notice this person is standing at the base about a little over one stone, maybe almost two of these stones tall, a little less. About the same height as that doorway in Coral Castle. Turns out the size of these stones is just about the same as, or the weight is just about the same as those of the Great Pyramid. Some of the stones that Ed Leedskallen lifted were even heavier than the heaviest stones at the Great Pyramid. How do you do that? 100 pound guy, he had a little tripod with a chain on it that couldn't have held very many pounds. But he had that gizmo with the magnetic uh, flywheel. Now we're going to look at a sample of John Hutchison's work. See, he's still amongst us. He had another birthday a few days ago. He can demonstrate this in the here and now. I can't go back and visit George Piggott or Nikola Tesla. But I can go visit John Hutchison and see a demonstration of this. And here's an iron block, two inches by two inches by seven inches tall, solid iron. This is uh, what it used to be. Um, this thing buckles over. Notice the fumes coming off of it. It'll come off part way through. And we saw fumes coming out of a door handle. See this door handle? This is at, uh, on 9-11. The fumes. It's a broken window. If something needs to vent out, why doesn't it go out the window? And John Hutchison's samples are a little bit cooler than ambient temperature after he's finished with them. It's not hot. Kind of reminds you of these, uh, what look to be fires, the Cheeto fires and Cheetos in the ground. They're orange, they're glowing, not necessarily hot. John has a boat, toy boat in the water. Notice when he turns the power off, you can see when it's going because the water jumps up. The boat goes into spontaneous combustion. He 
but here's the water, he's got the signal going now, and then he turns it off, and the, then it ignites. Kind of like the toasted cars. They ignited after the tower was destroyed, immediately after. It's a plastic boat. What's catching on fire? This thing's kind of interesting. A uh, solid piece of steel. Jelly. Now watch this piece of steel here. In this area, it'll come apart and move. He plugs this into a regular wall outlet. He's not efficient about it. He's not really a scientist. He just enjoys playing with this different type of technology. He tried to replicate the work of Nikola Tesla and he started discovering, hey, this is fun. Let's see, we can make this thing fly up, up in the air. And so he does it with a sense of intuition and feel for how to mix the signals. What he does is create a static field and within the static field, he interferes radio frequency signals, like microwave, as an example. It's not the microwave signal, and it's not the static field. It's the combination. It's kind of like a key opening a lock. Another kind of interesting uh, issue. This is right across from where that building went missing. Building four, right across the street from it. You have these round holes through one pane sometimes without breaking the inner pane. Holes here, they're roundish kind of holes. Some are look even more round. If you throw a baseball through, I'd love to see a kid ask the teacher this. Teacher, when I throw a baseball through the window, it looks like a spiderweb pattern. Why doesn't that look like that? Because when a rock hits a window, a mechanical load hits a window, it bends it. And glass is a brittle material that can't handle tension. And that outer edge, when it bows out, breaks from the tension. So what's going on here? This is actually done in someone's lab with longitudinal energy waves. This is kind of an analogy I drew. I drew. Imagine this, turn it sideways and drop a pebble into a pond and it sends a ripple out. Imagine something not a mechanical load but another kind of load that sends a ripple outward. I wonder if that's what makes that round hole. It is very rounded. Let's go back to look at them, keep jumping around because all these things kind of come together. Hurricane Andrew, there's a two before through the palm tree. How does that happen? Plywood. And I'm sure you've heard of straw through trees. But we're told, we don't know this, but we're told the straw is flying so fast it goes through trees. Does that make sense? Do you stop and think about it? Because force is force equal and opposite forces on the two. How can straw build up that much force to go through a tree? Well, it turns out that with John Hutchison's work, he's got this knife in this uh, aluminum block. He's also got a piece of wood in aluminum. Wood would burn up if you heated it hot enough to melt the aluminum. But they blend into each other. It's as though when the signal is turned on, I, I say it's a, sort of analogous to musical chairs. While the music's playing, people are walking around, you take one of the chairs away, and then when the music stops, people are supposed to sit back down, and somebody misses out because they don't have a chair. Well, think of the atoms and molecules like that. They're, they kind of let go, and they're up and moving around when the music stops. They try to grab onto something, and some of them miss out. And I think that explains some of the um, rustification that we see. But it, it explains also the jellification of some materials. Then when the signal stops, it re-solidifies. Let's think of what hurricanes and tornadoes do. It's a lot like a Tesla coil. And creates, also creates a static field. Now these are a little bit uh, out of place, but it's um, interesting, this rustification here. So we're talking about, oh, it's, I guess actually it's in the right place, um, musical chairs. When the steel 
uh, you know, the music's playing, the molecules and so forth let go of each other. Structural steel isn't just iron. It's mostly iron, but it has a few other doodads added in, like carbon, so forth, to help its structural properties and to help it uh, be more resistant to environmental effects. Steel does not rust that easily. Iron rusts instantly, just about. Get an iron skillet, leave it in your sinks with water in it, you come back, it's bright orange. Unless it has a layer of grease or something on it. But it's easily rust, real quickly. Steel does not. So how do you get steel to rust like iron? Let's say it was uh, the musical chairs type of analogy was going on, and the stuff was floating around so much it didn't quite grab back in with the carbon uh, atoms and so forth, and it's turned into pure iron on the surface. Then it would rust like that. This is Banker's Trust. Banker's Trust was damaged. Didn't have a fire in it. It was right across the street from <coughs> Building 2. And they decided to repair it afterwards. They repaired it, and then they started taking it apart dismantling it. And they took it down floor by floor, and they got down to that area where they had repaired it. And this was that region. That's where all the rust is. Pretty weird. That looks like it's been at the bottom of the ocean for a hundred years. So for those who uh, need to compare ideas, this, what I present, is not a theory. I present evidence, and I have evidence of something that can mimic all the effects. I'm not saying it is that. I think the only person who knows is who pushed the button that day, but, uh, or who held the gun to their head to make them do it. Uh, but what we see is how we could replicate all the effects. Now, these are the bits of evidence that we have. These are the theories or speculations or hypotheses they can't produce any of these effects. Matter of fact, to the contrary. You put a bomb in the basement, you break the bathtub. Bombs are hot. If you break the bathtub and water rushes in, you have a steam explosion. You also have a seismic signal with a big bomb in the basement. If you cut the building up for controlled demolition, drop it to the ground, you'd have a pile of rubble left. It just goes on and on. None of these things can explain any of those. So, where do the towers go? Gone with the wind. I have a few other slides if you're interested in those. After this, I just put them in at the end. Um, what thermite does, for anyone who's not cured of that idea? There's a slight problem with thermite. If thermite were used to destroy the towers, there's something missing. I don't know if you've heard this song before. It's Blinded by the light. Anyone in that area would have been blinded by the light, whether it's a nuke or a bunch of thermite. This is what thermites use for welding railroad tracks. It's also used for burning paper. Did you see the did you see above our heads? This is a Look tornado. Above Look above you, right here. Look at that. Oh my god. Get out of the shot. Shoot. I'm shooting.
Folks think of her of uh, tornadoes as being like a vortex that like a toilet draining that comes down from the sky. It's an energy field, a vortex type of energy field that happens to occur naturally. Uh, this one started from the ground up. It's a potential between the clouds and the ground. It turns out that there's a whole lot of similarities between this and what happened to 9-11. People talk about anti-gravity. And those who've been inside a tornado and picked up by one, they can breathe fine. It's not like a big vacuum cleaner. Hopefully they don't get too busted up. Let's see. It, you know, is that, now, now that you've seen all the slides, you look at this. Can you call that a collapse? That is a new process we've never seen before. This looks like a squirting out. Somebody... Or like a foam. It really wasn't that loud. And there's something else that uh, some folks have wanted me to talk about. Here's the hole in the North Tower. The plane shaped hole. I just, it's a hole. I don't go into why it's there, what caused it. But what I would say is this little slot here, airplane wings can't do that. But up here at the 105th floor, notice that fellow. We're going to take a closer look. We heard about all these jumpers. There he is there. These guys over here, some of them have their shirt off, some have their pants off. Does that make sense if it's hot? Would they do it because of a bomb in the building? Would they do it because of fire? Why would they do that? And this fellow looks like he's taking his pants off. This is the 105th floor. Uh, okay, if he needs to take his pants off, for some bizarre reason, we don't need to solve that for this question, why doesn't he just step inside? Smoke, you say? Well, he could hold his breath, step inside, take the pants off, and get back out. So why doesn't he do that? Why does he have to take his pants off while dangling from the 105th floor by like one hand and one foot? And the firefighters on the ground, those poor, poor guys, that must have been utter torment. They've been trained to save lives, and there was nothing they could do. They had to watch. There's one fellow that they talked about having to watch because he wanted to go out and start catching people. The, feeling helpless, I think, is about the worst human emotion there is. And they've been trained to save lives. And one, of, several of the fellows said that there's like five a minute, four a minute, three a minute out of each face of the building. Let's estimate three a minute out of each face of the building the whole time. That's four, uh, the three a minute, uh, the four faces, that's 12 a minute. The building was standing for 100 minutes, that's 1,200 people. Left the North Tower, approximately. And uh, there was 343 firefighters that were killed at the basement. That's, add those together, that's 1,543. Guess how many separate people were identified? just under 1,600. So it's approximately the number of people who left the building. What happened to people in the building? Probably the same as the rest. Now, what would cause you to do this? These people want to live, or else they wouldn't still be hanging on. And the firefighters had never seen people jump like this before. Maybe they'd seen, in all the 20 years on the forest, seen one jumper from a building. And that was like the third story. Nothing like this. Something different was going on. So if I'm up there and the building's on fire, I'm going to go to the bathroom as fast as I can before we lose water pressure and get myself wet. I'll be wet. Maybe if I have some extra clothing, soak that down, wrap it around my head, and head for the door, head for the stairs. If the sprinklers came on, I'd be wet. If the sprinklers didn't come on, it was hot in there, 
I'd be wet. So it's a good chance these people are wet. Now, they have a lot of motivation to take their clothes off because firefighters wear extra clothes to protect them from fires. They don't fight fires in the nude. So there's something else going on there too. This isn't because they're hot. You know, when you put, um, th this is just an example, not meant to be implied that's exactly what it was, but when you put uh, food on a paper plate in the oven, in the microwave oven, the chicken on the plate cooks, but the paper plate doesn't, if it doesn't have water molecules in it. If it's wet, then it heats up. Water molecules are affected more by microwave energy. It's a form of directed energy. Let's say there's some type of energy field within the building, maybe microwave. So if you were wet, or wet clothing, you'd want to get those wet clothes off or else you'd be feeling like you were being fried. Uh, crowd control, nowadays they have this active denial system that microwaves a crowd, makes them want to just get out of there as fast as they can. So the active denial system they call it, but um, really this behavior seems explainable by some weird energy field within the building because they're hanging outside the building. Also, they want to take their clothes off outside the building. People hear about uh, uh, thermitic material being found in the dust. What's thermitic material? Well, we have a building that was turned to powder midair. What was the building made out of? It was a steel structure with aluminum cladding. Let's dustify that, turn the building into nano dust. You have aluminum and iron. Iron, that fine, is going to rust immediately. Guess what thermite is? Yeah. This and this. So if we didn't have that in the dust, something more serious would be wrong. People will talk about hearing booms. Remember, hot things glow, but not everything that glows is hot. Bombs go boom, but not everything that goes boom is a bomb. It's a Scott tank. The air tanks, the firefighters wore. There were quite a few firefighters who witnessed Scott tanks exploding at ground level that were in fire trucks. So, pretty much ends it. to say something here. I am just kind of overwhelmed by you folks. An audience who wants to hear about this, who wants to understand, it just really warms my heart. <laughs> Absolutely awesome bit of research there. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Judy Wood. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.